So, uh, welcome everyone to the eighth annual Spiegelman Oration. Um, I pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and to their elders past and present. Uh, this oration is, of course, named after the Honourable James Spiegelman, ACQC. It commemorates the vast contribution made in the field of public law by his honour, not only as Chief Justice of New South Wales, but also as an advocate and as a public thinker. Uh, my name is Stephen Lloyd. Um, in a peaceful transition of power, the envy of great nations, I succeeded to the position um, of convener of, public, of the public law section of the New South Wales Bar. To be fair, I wasn't troubled with anything as mundane as an election. Um, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Mr. Neil Williams, SC, my predecessor as the convener of the public law section. Uh, he undertook the task, um, or that task, along with uh, all that he does with distinction. He maintained a section as a vibrant contributor to the development of thinking in the public law field. For almost 10 years, he cajoled and encouraged the uh, already overworked to produce papers across a very broad spectrum of constitutional and administrative law subjects. The topics that he suggested have often been subjects of importance to the profession, even if not always of interest to academia. In addition to coordinating uh, the presentation of such papers, he also coordinated the publication of them. He has produced two books in his role as convener, and I think a third may be in development. He also envisaged and gave life to the Spiegelman Oration series. Um, he has left intimidatingly large boots for me to fill. Uh, so I take this public opportunity to thank Neil for his service to the bar as convener of the section. Um, tonight's presenter of the Spiegelman oration, of course, needs no introduction. Um, given public health concerns, we originally planned to present the oration only as a webinar. However, the level of demand to attend in person, even during a pandemic, was such that we are here uh, this evening, as well as uh, many people watching online. Although our speaker may need no introduction, it doesn't mean I won't give him one. Um, after completing his schooling in England, Alan attended the Australian National University where he graduated um, with a Bachelor of Arts with honours, followed quickly by a Bachelor of Laws with honours. Shortly thereafter, he commenced practice as a legal officer in the Attorney General's Department. Uh, he apparently made a good impression because within a year or so, he was working for the then Commonwealth Solicitor General, Sir Morris Byers. When Sir Morris returned to the New South Wales Bar, Alan came to the bar as well, reading with the uh, Honourable William Gummo AC, as his honour then wasn't. Um, Alan commenced practice on the ground uh, floor Wentworth Chambers before moving to St James Hall. He was appointed to the Administrative Review Council in 1992, where I first met him while I was working there in the Secretariat. He took silk in 1995. His practice at the bar was broad, frequently involving public law and revenue issues. He appeared in the High Court well in excess of 60 times, including the leading constitutional and tax cases of the day. Just to mention a few, uh, Castle Main Tuis in South Australia, Waterford in the Commonwealth, Cole and Whitfield, Davis in the Commonwealth, Bath and Austin Holdings, Street and Queensland Bar Association, Gould and Brown, and the Native Title Act case. He also appeared as counsel in over 300 cases in the federal court. For 22 years, he was a consultant editor of the CCH High Court and Federal Court Practice. He was, I believe, the inaugural convener of the administrative law section of the bar. He also became the convener of the constitutional law section of the bar, merging uh, those two sections. He was, of course, appointed to the Federal Court of Australia in 2011. Uh, he has also served as a deputy president of the AAT and a deputy president of the Competition Tribunal. 
Um, he served on the federal court until May of this year. He's currently president of the Australian Academy of Law and an honorary professor at the Australian National University. Alan is speaking tonight on the topic, supervising the legal boundaries of executive powers. On this topic, Alan has a wealth of experience ranging from exercising executive power, uh, defending the exercise of executive power, challenging the exercise of executive power, and adjudicating, adjudicating on the lawfulness of the exercise of executive power. I can think of no one better placed to address this topic. I'm very grateful that he agreed uh, to present this talk, and I am pleased now to call upon the Honourable Alan Robertson, SC. Your Honours, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, um, I too acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose lands uh, we're meeting, and I acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. It's a privilege and honour for me. Uh, to give the Spiegelman oration for 2020. Uh, I followed Justice Keane in 2019, uh, the Commonwealth Attorney General in 2018, Chief Justice Bathurst in 2017, Justice Virginia Bell in 2016, and Chief Justice Alsop in 2015. The inaugural Spiegelman oration was given by Justice Gagler in 2014. I had the pleasure of introducing both the then new oration and the speaker. I then reminisced that I first met Jim Spiegelman in 1973, uh, which seemed like a long time ago, but in hindsight, uh, it's just after the uh, president-elect of the United States was first elected to the US Senate from Delaware in 1972. Um, three of these addresses, as Stephen has said, uh, are collected in key issues in public law, the volume edited by Neil Williams and published by the Federation Press in 2017. Much has been said and written in recent times about executive power, or as people like to say, the executive power. Uh, Professor Seddon, Professor Nick Seddon, has referred recently to the, to, the to tsunami of learned articles on the Williams cases. He said that sadly Brian Paper died and Ron Williams was defeated by the Commonwealth resort to section 96 of the Constitution despite his two High Court uh, victories. I shall do my best to stay away from that uh, water. Uh, my aims are more uh, modest. I shall outline them in a moment. But first I want to mention that the 2010 Garin oration, given under the auspices of the Institute of Public Administration Australia, published in 2010 in the Australian Bar Review, was entitled Public Law and the, and the Executive and was delivered by J.J. Spiegelman. And what he then wrote remains applicable to this evening's topic. He wrote that the extent of the executive power of the Commonwealth appears to have been cut free from the traditional conception of prerogative powers in a manner which means that there is, there is now no source of guidance as to the boundaries of executive power. The delineation of the permissible scope of the executive power of the Commonwealth will develop on a case-by-case -case basis, albeit with reference to the traditional categories of the prerogative. This new fo focus will probably lead to a change of terminology. In terms of our legal history, he wrote, this is quite a dramatic development. In England, a king was executed and a civil war was waged to limit the scope of the prerogative and to assert the supremacy of Parliament. However, the executive power is apparently no longer confined to well-established traditional categories. It is revealing to contrast two judicial statements. Lord Diplock uh, put it thus, it is 350 years and a civil war too late for the Queen's Court to broaden the prerogative. Uh, that was in BBC and Jones in 1965. And in the tax bonus case, which is PAPE, Chief Justice French said of Section 61, while history and common law inform its content, it is not a locked display cabinet in a constitutional uh, museum. What I want to uh, talk about tonight, I've tried to break up into six issues. Uh, first, 
I'll describe the general framework and what I'm not going to talk about, which is uh, that part of the executive power that involves only the execution of statutes. Uh, we're all familiar, or maybe too familiar, uh, with that. And also, as Professor Seddon has suggested, enough has been written for the time being about contracts and about the expenditure of money drawn from the Treasury. Second, I want to identify why or how it is that the courts conduct judicial review of non-statutory powers. This will involve identifying the correct footing. Is it the case that the so-called grounds stem only from statutory construction? Uh, does not statutory construction uh, give effect to common law rules, leaving aside interpretation acts? There should be no conceptual difficulty in concluding that the common law by which non-statutory executive powers has since the early 17th century been controlled also provides the basis for court supervision of those powers. I note that much of this was considered by Justice Mason in 1981 in Tui in the uh, northern, ex part of the Northern Land Council. My contention is that the same common law principles that inform interpretation of a statutory executive power also inform the scope of non-statutory executive power. Third, I want to examine shortly to put to one side uh, what I call a manner of exercise incantation associated with Darnell's case in 1627. Uh, it, it was said to be, or thought to be, a field from which the courts uh, were excluded. Uh, it should be discarded. Uh, on one view, this was achieved uh, in the United Kingdom by the 1980s in the Council of Civil Service Union uh, case. Uh, uh, it has never had, or should never have had, a firm foothold in Australian law by reason of Section 75 of the Constitution. Uh, fourth, I need to touch briefly on the subject matter idea of immunity from judicial review and consider whether that is a gateway proposition or better seen as an aspect of justiciability. I will look at how Lord Roskill's list of subject matters in CCSU has fared since 1985, uh, and uh, to give you a preview, the answer is not very well. Uh, fifth, uh, I wish to revisit what Lord Diplock said about irrationality in CCSU in light of subsequent arguably more radical developments in Australia in the Minister for Immigration and Lee, that's LI, in 249 Commonwealth Law Reports, and more recently, last month, I think, in ABT 17 and the Minister for Immigration 2020 HCA uh, 34. Uh, six and lastly, I want to descend from all of that high ground to consider whether judicial review of the exercise of non-statutory powers has implications for so-called soft law. How should non-statutory guidelines or policies be approached uh, in this context? So first then, the uh, general framework. Uh, the framework is not that the executive power of the Commonwealth is the same as executive power in the United Kingdom. Williams number two established that. Uh, that would be to confuse concepts particularly applicable to a unitary system with an unwritten constitution with the federal system in Australia. The proper starting point is section 61, informed by the common law, including common law powers. Uh, and their limitations. This stems not only from the terms of Section 61, but also from the federal structure and from the clearer separation of powers, particularly Chapter 3. Flowing from Mewitt's case, which I'll examine in a moment briefly, and from Kirk, which I'll also uh, mention a little more fully, uh, the idea that sheltered the so-called prerogative powers from judicial review for so long on the basis that quote, the king can do no wrong, close quote, has no place. Commonwealth and Mewitt in 1997 seems to me to be a very important precursor uh, to Kirk. Uh, the key question for present purposes was the gulf between the historical position in the United Kingdom uh, and the consequent repositioning or diminution of the importance of the provisions of uh, the Judiciary Act, which up until that time... Uh, had been thought to be essential 
to liability uh, of the uh, Commonwealth. Mr. Mewitt uh, was a RAN seaman uh, who was injured on, on board HMS uh, Kembla and he uh, sued the Commonwealth, uh, the jurisdiction of the High Court being said to be attracted by Section 75.3. So the relevant issues were the source and nature of the liability of the Commonwealth uh, in contract and, uh, and in tort. And in the joint judgment, the essential reasoning uh, was this. Uh, as Justice Brennan put it in Georgiadis, the liability is created by the common law. In respect of that liability, the Constitution applies to deny any operation to what otherwise might be doctrines of Crown or executive immunity. The constitutional denial of the operation of any immunity doctrine in respect of matters in which this court has original jurisdiction under Section 75 is carried forward when under Section 77 the Parliament makes laws with respect to the matters mentioned in Section 75. Uh, Section 75.5 also contributed uh, to the reasoning uh, uh, and the acceptance of the principle in Marbury and Madison as axiomatic in the Australian Communist Party case placed a fundamental limitation upon any general acceptance in the exercise of federal jurisdiction of the maxim that the sovereign can do no wrong. To the contrary, it was for the judicial branch of government to determine controversies as to whether the legislative or executive branches had exceeded their constitutional mandates. Uh, the term the Commonwealth in Section 75.3 encompasses the totality of what is established in Chapter 2 as the executive government of the Commonwealth, uh, and the jurisdiction uh, conferred by 75.3 was expressed so as to cover the enforcement of actionable rights and liabilities of officers and agencies in their official and governmental capacity when in substance they formed part of or represented uh, the Commonwealth. It follows that there should be no room in our thinking for resort first to prerogative and from there to the idea that there must be something special about non-statutory executive powers, especially in the sense that the manner of their exercise stands outside Chapter 3. In light of Chapter 3, there is no room for the common law principle that the king can do no wrong. As an aside, uh, it would be strange for the United Kingdom courts, therefore, to embrace judicial review of what they call the prerogative, uh, which for present purposes is non-statutory executive power, in the CCSU case and in Bancool's case in 2009, but for Australian courts uh, to balk. An essential starting point for considering the position in Australia is that non-statutory executive power, the Commonwealth, is constitutionally conferred by Section 61 and is therefore limited by Section 61. Regard must be had to constitutional history uh, and the common law. The subsisting so-called prerogative powers fall within Section 61, as one can see from uh, Williams No. 1. Once you get to that realisation, it must be unhelpful to start with the idea that calling an exercise of power prerogative is a useful tool of analysis. It might tell you something about the history of that part of the executive power, but that is all. Even in respect to the United Kingdom, Professor Poole, in an article called The Strange Death of Prerogative in England, has written, uh, it may be time to stop talking about prerogative altogether. The term obscures more than it elucidates, but then again, it has done that for a long time. We should update our legal categories to match our constitutional thinking. Just as we now speak about the executive's general administrative powers as opposed to prerogatives, so too we should ditch prerogative and talk instead about the general executive powers uh, of government. And Professor Mark Elliott, uh, wrote recently about the position in the United Kingdom. Prerogative powers today are simply a form of executive power and there is no good constitutional reason why. Other things being equal, their exercise should not be amenable to scrutiny on public law grounds just as uh, statutory 
uh, uh, powers are. And he referred to what Lord Ruskell had said in the CCSU case. There will be difficult cases uh, as to whether the non-statutory executive power in question has been displaced or modified by statute. In the United Kingdom, you'll recall de Kaiser's Royal Hotel in 1920. Uh, the older authorities go back at least as far as the prohibitions del Roi in 1608 and the case of proclamations in 1611. In Australia, the cases of high authority on this issue include Barton and the Commonwealth in 131 CLR and Ruddock and Vidalis in 110 FCR and CPCF in 255 CLR. I've referred to limitations. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the absence of any prerogative power to dispense with the operation of the general law. Well, we can look at A and Hayden in 1984 for that. Uh, the absence of a power, prerogative power, to levy taxes upon the subject or to ex exact, extort or raise monies from the subject for the use of the king uh, as the price of exercising his control in a particular way or as a consideration for permit permitting the subject to carry on his trade or business. And we find that in the High Court in colonial combing, spinning and weaving in 1922. Similarly, uh, as a limitation, uh, the uh, authorisation or the attempt to authorise enforce or enforce a deprivation of liberty. And one can see that in Bolton ex parte Bean in 1987. In Brown and West, uh, the High Court said, whatever the scope of the executive power of the Commonwealth might otherwise be, it is susceptible of control by statute. A valid law of the Commonwealth may so limit or impose conditions on the exercise of the executive power that acts which would otherwise be supported by the executive power fall outside its scope. As I've mentioned, uh, one limitation is the separation of powers. Another is section 92 uh, as a limitation on Commonwealth, state and territory, legislative and executive power. Uh, so too the implied freedom of political co communication. So too encroachment on important common law rights. Uh, where prerogative power is, is concerned, it has uh, the power to affect uh, rights. I'll leave to one side for tonight's purposes a non-statutory capacity concerned with the uh, position of the executive where it'll be subject to the law of the land in common with uh, open quote, ordinary close quote uh, people. There's a general analysis in M68, a uh, plaintiff M68, <coughs> Uh, of the constitutional uh, framework. So I'm concerned with the residue of discretionary or arbitrary authority, which at any given time is legally left in the hands of the Crown. Uh, leaving aside, as Dicey wrote, powers conferred on the Crown or its servants by parliamentary enactments, he said we may use the term prerogative as equivalent to the discretionary authority of the executive and then lay down that the conventions of the Constitution are in the main precepts for determining the mode and spirit in which the prerogative is to be exercised, or what is really the same thing, for fixing the manner in which any transaction which can legally be done in virtue of the royal prerogative ought to be carried out. Before I leave this general framework, uh, I bring to your attention what uh, Harrison Moore wrote in his first edition in 1902 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth that uh, uh, seems to me to involve good practical sense in light of the ink that's been spilt uh, since then on implied nationhood and the place of the prerogative in that context. He wrote, uh, there is much more in government than the execution of the law, whether enacted or unenacted, just as there, just as there is more in human conduct than the creation of legal relations. The state is a going concern. It has affairs which must be managed with prudence and judgment and which are not necessarily related to law in any other sense than that in which all conduct must be bounded by legal restraints. One other thing I want to mention by way of framework is the fundamental change uh, 
in terms of this analysis in the 20th century, the movement from um, the uh, position in uh, for what I call crown uh, privilege, so-called crown privilege, the movement from Duncan and Camel Laird in 1942, uh, which reflected what the High Court and the Privy Council had said in Duncan and Theodore, which in turn informed what Justice Dixon said in the Australian Communist Party case when he famously said, uh, as a basis for uh, finding the law to be invalid, I might add, the counsels of the Crown are secret and an inquiry into the grounds upon which the advice tendered proceeds may not be made for the purpose of invalidating the act formally done in the name of the Crown by the Governor General. Um, time has marched on since then. Conway, Conway and Rimmer uh, was decided in 1968. It went from the uh, understandable, that is Duncan and Camel Laird in 1942, concerned with the sinking of the submarine Thetis at the beginning of the Second World War and uh, an attempt by the plaintiffs uh, when the submarine uh, sank to get access to the design, amongst other things, of the submarine, went from there to the uh, frankly ridiculous uh, in Conway and Rimmer, uh, where uh, the uh, probationary police constable, Conway, uh, in 1964, uh, was accused by another probationer uh, of having lost his, uh, having stolen, I should say, his electric torch worth 15 shillings and threepence. Uh, in any event, uh, the then uh, Right Honourable Roy Jenkins, the relevant uh, Principal Secretary, swore an affidavit uh, to the effect that uh, confidential reports by police officers, uh, etc., were covered by Crown Privilege, as it was then called, uh, and that uh, proposition was exploded. I should add that in Sankey and Whitlam, in my view, the High Court went even further uh, by uh, not immunising from review the state papers referred to by Lord Reid in uh, Conway uh, and Rimmer. But the point for present purposes is uh, once the court can see the evidence of the executive action, including decision-making, so much the more likely is the court to find that the so-called prerogative is not immune from uh, judicial review. Uh, the second issue then is identifying why or how it is that the courts conduct judicial review of non-statutory executive powers. And here, if, if time permitted, uh, I would defend the reputation of uh, Sir Gerard Brennan, who was thought to be uh, the uh, main uh, proponent of the view that there was uh, no such thing as uh, judicial review outside uh, statutory uh, powers. Uh, he's been uh, accused of uh, uh, having strong reservations about the extension of common law judicial review uh, and recanting in post-retirement, uh, but uh, I'm not at all sure that this is uh, accurate. If you look at Church of Scientology and Woodward, if you look at South Australia and Tanner, and if you look indeed at Attorney General for New South Wales, uh, and Quinn, uh, where he, he, Justice Brennan said the duty of the court extends to judicial review of administrative action alleged to go beyond the power conferred by statute or by the prerogative or alleged to be otherwise in disconformity uh, with the law. Uh, certainly, he also wrote extrajudicially uh, to the same uh, effect. Uh, and indeed, in, our, in an article in 1997, uh, which is really what I've been saying so far, uh, just as Brennan said, under Chapter 3, all federal legislative and executive power is brought under the supervision of the judicial power in order to ensure conformity with the Constitution and the laws made under it. No exception is allowed. No immunity of a federal legislative or executive act from judicial review is possible. Um, So, uh, although His Honour was dealing mainly in those cases with statutory construction, uh, he uh, was not uh, 
uh, in an other fields, limiting what could be done to what could be done under uh, statutory construction. And after all, I would ask, uh, where did the principles of statutory construction uh, come from, if not from the common law? Baroness Hale in CART in 2012, appeal cases, uh, said that one of the three clear points in that case was that the scope of judicial review is an artifact of the common law whose object is to maintain uh, the rule of law. The competing history uh, is well summarised in uh, an article called The Integrity Branch of Government uh, by uh, Chief Justice Spiegelman in 2004. Uh, I don't have time to uh, set it all out. Uh, and also in two decisions of the, in the Court of Appeal, Van Meld uh, and South Sydney uh, City Council. Uh, I think the last word on this issue should go to Sir Anthony Mason, uh, sitting as a non-permanent judge in the uh, Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal, a case called C in the Director of Immigration, C as in the letter C. Uh, the threshold question was whether the relevant decisions of the director to remove the appellants were subject to uh, judicial review. And Sir Anthony Mason uh, traced the common law uh, aspect from Cooper and Wandsworth uh, Board of Works uh, and to the view which he expressed that the foundation of judicial review is the rule of law, and the rule of law as a foundation has the advantage that it extends judicial review to the exercise of non-statutory powers, including prerogative and common law powers, referring to CCSU. Conceptually, approaching the question of judicial review of non-statutory executive power involves accepting that the supervisory jurisdiction does not rest on the intention of Parliament, with the consequence that the ultra vares doctrine does not mark the logical boundary of judicial review. The point was made by Professor Elliott in the Constitutional Foundations of uh, Judicial Review, uh, and uh, Lord Justice Sales, as he was, made the same point in 2015, uh, saying that whilst the common law is not exactly the source of prerogative power, it is only to the extent that it is recognised by the common law and permitted to have operation that the authority, that the authority claims, uh, which it embodies, is effective in law. And this involves an examination of historical claims over time. Similarly, Professor uh, Toomey, Professor Anne Toomey, uh, wrote in 2018 that although the prerogative preceded the existence of the common law, uh, the, its existence is recognised by the common law and its extent is determined uh, by the common law. Then I turn to uh, this manner of exercise uh, idea, uh, which uh, was, before CCSU, uh, said to be associated with the uh, prerogative. Uh, the, um, I should uh, allow myself one aside about CCSU because I found in a book an article written by Richard Drabble, as he was, uh, junior counsel for the unions. Uh, you remember the case went off on the basis that uh, consultation by the Prime Minister with the unions would be uh, contrary to national security, and the House of Lords said, well, we can't uh, look at that. Uh, according to Richard Drabble, anyway, all of this structure uh, was a point taken for the first time in the Court of Appeal, and it was ba based solely on paragraph 16 of the affidavit of Robert Armstrong, as he then was, and known to us, <laughs> which read, uh, only so far, to have entered such consultations would have served to bring out the vulnerability of areas of operation to those who had shown themselves ready to organise disruption, and consultation with individual members of staff would have been impossible without involving the national unions. Ministers also were aware of the view that the importance of the decision was such as to warrant it first being announced in Parliament, full stop. Um, so, um, the, the case chronologically that uh, I should next mention 
uh, is a case called Bangku in uh, 2009 appeal cases. And there, uh, as I count them, uh, everyone in the House of Lords agreed with Lord Hoffman, who said he could see no reason why prerogative legislation should not be subject to review on ordinary principles of legality, rationality, and procedural impropriety in the same way as any other executive action. Uh, and he referred uh, to the, the difference between the prerogative, which uh, did not have the representative character of uh, legislation uh, founded on the unique authority of Parliament, uh, but nevertheless, it was for the courts to inquire uh, into the exercise of uh, uh, a particular uh, prerogative uh, power. <clears throat> It is, uh, as I'll develop shortly, questionable whether the familiar principles, or all of them, can be applied to prerogative legislation in the ordinary way. Uh, usually, as you know, in judicial review, the court ascertains the proper purposes for which a decision maker may act and the relevant considerations uh, by construing the relevant statute. In the case of non-statutory powers, there is no governing statute uh, to construe. <clears throat> The, um, I'll come back to the uh, review by the courts of uh, areas that uh, Lord Roskill thought were immune from uh, judicial review by reference to their uh, subject matter. Um, but before leaving this uh, manner of exercise uh, point, uh, I'll make two short points. One is, uh, first of all, the difference between uh, reviewing prerogative powers, the exercise of them, and the manner of exercise is not a stable uh, distinction. Uh, the extent of a prerogative power uh, one can easily conceive as being qualified by conditions as to the way it should be exercised. But perhaps the even uh, shorter point uh, for uh, present purposes uh, is that uh, it really has uh, no place uh, in uh, Australia, as explained by the High Court in Jarrett and the Commissioner of Police, um, and uh, which harked back to what Justice Winyard had said uh, in uh, 1964. Uh, one can see, of course, the same point being made in S157. I've had to pass over the details for the time being of uh, Miller number two, uh, but uh, I think the judge has got some enjoyment from the handwritten uh, note of the Prime Minister, uh, and I can't do the accent, so I'll just read it. Uh, the whole September session is a rigmarole uh, introduced to show the public that MPs were earning their crust. <laughs> uh, so that was his view of uh, why uh, there was no harm in uh, proroguing uh, Parliament. Uh, the, of course, the Scottish uh, Court of Session found that uh, the Prime Minister's actual motive was, as they said, to stymie uh, the activities of Parliament, particularly the accountability of the executive to Parliament. Uh, as I read it, the Supreme Court didn't go quite so far, but arrived at the same result. Uh, by reference to not so much uh, actual motive, but the effect of what the uh, Prime Minister had uh, done. Uh, then um, I want to come next then to uh, the one or two cases uh, which I have time to mention uh, where CCSU has been uh, not at the level of the High Court, uh, but at the level of uh, Intermediate Courts of Appeal, uh, been found to be applicable. There was the well-known case of the, of course, of the uh, full court of the federal court in Pico Walls End in 1987, uh, involving the decision of the cabinet to nominate stage two of Kakadu National Park for inclusion in the World Heritage List. The principles of CCSU were embraced by the three judges, uh, but uh, each of them found that uh, the 
uh, subject matter or, or the way in which the case uh, would have to be worked through uh, would involve such complex policy considerations uh, that uh, the matter uh, lay in the political arena, or to put it another way, it was not uh, justiciable. Uh, the other well-known case, uh, Intermediate Court of Appeal, uh, was uh, in Victoria, Victoria and the Master Builders Association in 1995, where there was a a task force set up and various uh, non-complying uh, building contractors uh, were uh, blacklisted uh, in the sense that uh, all Victorian government departments and agencies and municipal councils uh, were uh, not to use the uh, non-conforming uh, building companies and the court found that uh, there was no difficulty in uh, treating that as a subject matter that the court could, could consider and held that uh, the entities had been denied uh, procedural fairness. Uh, justiciable, as you know, is uh, a difficult word. I am using it as a matter of characterization and really to mean whether the issue is appropriate and fit for judicial resolution, capable of judicial determination, or better fitted for determination by the uh, non-judicial agencies of government. Then I wanted to turn briefly to Lord Roskill's uh, list of matters which he thought, by way of subject matter, uh, would not be challengeable on judicial review. Uh, and his list was those related to the making of treaties, the defence of the realm, the prerogative of mercy, the grant of honours, the dissolution of parliament, uh, and the appointment of ministers, as, as well as others. Matters have moved on. The UK courts have now accepted the justiciability of decisions of the executive relating to the grant of pardons, uh, foreign affairs and national security, ex parte Bentley on the grant of pardons, uh, Lewis and the Attorney General of Jamaica on the prerogative of mercy, uh, Everett on the refusal of prerogative refusal of passports, uh, Abassi on foreign relations and diplomatic representations, and uh, Sandiford uh, and uh, Yusuf in the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, so those matters are no longer, uh, at least in the United Kingdom, immune from uh, judicial review. I want to look at uh, one topic, uh, current topic in Australia without suggesting any answer because, as I understand it, uh, an application for special leave is pending there was a decision in August this year of the uh, Queensland Court of Appeal called Holsinger and the Attorney General, uh, which was followed uh, at the end of October by a full court of the Federal Court in Ogawa. And um, the question was, broadly speaking, uh, the uh, prerogative of uh, mercy. Uh, it seemed like the Queensland structure was probably uh, statutory. Uh, one of the things that the Court of Appeal said at paragraph 18 was that the exercise of the prerogative of mercy may involve a consideration of matters that are not justiciable because they are only relevant to a pure act of mercy or because they involve policy with, with respect to public demands or expectations of, or factors which depend upon information that does not rise to the level of, of admissible uh, evidence. It follows that the authority of the Attorney General cannot rationally be constrained by any statutory or common law uh, criteria. The only observation, without questioning the result, uh, the only uh, observation uh, that I would make about it is that um, it seems to me to have the matter uh, back to front. The reason that because a non-statutory executive power may involve those considerations uh, it must follow that the complaint itself is not justiciable. Or put differently, on judicial review, uh, it's not the court that's being asked itself to exercise the discretion, so it shouldn't follow that the court cannot embark on the question whether, for example, the repository of the power has misunderstood it, which is what happened in uh, Bentley's case, uh, to which I've already uh, referred. 
Uh, and I think this is what the full court of the federal court had in mind in Ogawa, at paragraph 74, in saying that a recognition of the fact that there may well be some aspects of the decision-making power uh, which are essentially political or non-justiciable does not necessarily carry the consequence that any legal error manifest in that decision-making process should remain immune from uh, judicial uh, scrutiny. So my contention is that the preferable lens through which to view these matters is not the subject matter, uh, but whether the claims are justiciable in the sense that I've described and may be properly understood, uh, that is what uh, Lord uh, Roskill was uh, saying. Um, Professor Elliott, to whom I've already referred, uh, has been trying to deal uh, in his blogs and articles with the, what I call the backlash uh, from the executive uh, government in the United Kingdom to the decision in Miller number two. Professor Elliott has a robust, if not a trenchant, uh, style, uh, and uh, the UK government's review of judicial review, his, his article is entitled Limiting Judicial Review by Clarifying Non-Justiciability or putting lipstick on the proverbial pig. Uh, and he says that the questions of justiciability uh, fall to be resolved at a level of general abstraction, uh, concerned with broad brush matters such as subject matter, uh, makes no sense, or more precisely conflates an empirical outcome that may sometimes occur with an underlying premise that does not inevitably generate uh, that outcome. Uh, so moving then from the uh, prerogative of uh, mercy, uh, I, I'll mention, but only in passing, that there may, of course, be other, other good discretionary reasons for refusing to entertain judicial review in relation to a subject matter. And I give by way of example uh, Barton and the Commonwealth in 1980, that is, broadly speaking, prosec prosecutorial uh, decisions and uh, that the uh, other reason, discretionary reason, is interference with, uh, unnecessary interference with uh, the uh, criminal uh, process. <clears throat> then um, the other uh, case that I wanted to mention in this context may have been statutory rather than non, but the difference between challenging a policy and perhaps the application of the policy. Some 10 years ago in the full federal court, there was a case called I, A-Y-E, uh, and the policy, which uh, probably misguidedly the applicant sought to attack, was the policy of the executive which involved sanctions against Burmese military officers and their immediate families. Uh, one could predict that the court was going to find that the policy was non-justiciable. Uh, perhaps uh, if the application of the policy had been flawed in some way, the wrong person was identified uh, or the statute was uh, misconstrued or misapplied, then there would have been uh, better scope for judicial review. Next, I want to move on briefly to what Lord Diplock said about irrationality in CCSU in light of subsequent, I think, more radical developments in Australia. Lord Diplock, you will recall, said that he couldn't envisage uh, any real basis for an irrationality claim uh, when looking at non-statutory executive uh, powers. Things have perhaps moved on. Uh, certainly in England, and I'd say also certainly in Australia since uh, 1985. Uh, uh, Professor Mark Aronson, with, I think, some uh, anxiety, uh, has marked the change uh, in the, uh, some of the grounds of irrationality, moving from, as he described it, no evidence uh, to uh, cases where uh, serious irrationality or Ill illogicality uh, can form uh, review grounds uh, and um, 
that ten tends to suggest to me that uh, Lord Diplock's uh, high level reaction to irrationality uh, wouldn't uh, uh, work universally. The point that I re really want to make is this, and it comes out uh, via Lee, but as explained in two cases, one ABT 17 and 14, 14th of October in the High Court. Uh, and the uh, uh, point there made is that, uh, by the plurality, is that the implied condition of reasonableness is not confined to why, and this was a statutory decision, it's not confined to why a statutory decision is made, it extends to how a statutory decision is made, uh, referring to Lee at paragraph 91, uh, such that just as a power is exercised in an improper manner, if it is upon the material before the decision maker, a decision to which no reasonable person could come, so it is exercised in an improper manner if the, if the decision maker makes his or her decision in a manner so devoid of plausible justification that no reasonable person could have taken that course. And the full court of the federal court tried to tease out these two uh, elements of Lee in a decision called Singh in 2014 in 231 FCR uh, 437, uh, identifying two, con two different contexts in which the concept is employed. Now, um, one context is concentrating on the outcome of the exercise of the power, uh, and the other uh, is concentrating on the reasoning process by which the decision maker arrived at the exercise of the power. So, uh, in my contention, there is scope, although those cases were a statutory context, there's a scope for the same analysis when looking at uh, non-executive uh, statutory powers, uh, and that seems to be the uh, development that's uh, taking place uh, in England. Uh, another basis which can fit under the uh, legal unreasonableness uh, heading is where non-statutory executive powers are uh, inconsistent in some form with the uh, surrounding statutory scheme. It doesn't make them statutory powers, but the non-statutory powers need to be uh, consistent with uh, the statutory scheme. Uh, <clears throat> Then, uh, sixth and lastly, I wanted to uh, touch on soft law. Um, there's the difficult decision in Ex parte Lane about the non-statutory criminal injury compensation scheme in England, which has been, so far as I know, universally applied and adopted. It was explained in different ways in two decisions of the High Court, Hot Holdings in Creasy uh, and in Ainsworth and the Criminal uh, Justice Commission. Uh, I'm not sure how it was uh, that the non-statutory uh, scheme, which involved no legally enforceable rights, could nevertheless be subject to certiorari. Uh, perhaps it was error of law on the face of the record uh, where the board was construing their uh, guidelines. Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, but it may have had an element of what's now more developed in England, which is uh, substantive uh, procedural fairness. Um, there are uh, a number of cases uh, in the federal court where uh, guidelines uh, to guide the exercise of statutory powers uh, have been and are causing uh, difficulty, particularly under the Migration Act. At my last count, there were some uh, eight or nine of them, and they are uh, going to be the subject of the hearing of appeals, not all, not all or eight or nine of them, but uh, two of them anyway, in full court sittings in February uh, next year. There seem to, be, seem to be two strands of thought in play. One is whether legal unreasonableness is excluded from the scheme uh, because uh, procedural fairness is excluded, as established by Plaintiff S10, and the other centres uh, on the difficult decision of uh, a full court in 1994, which is uh, whether, as Justice French and Justice Drummond 
uh, said at the time, uh, uh, non-statutory guidelines can nevertheless uh, give rise to uh, an error of law. I, I would say that uh, the idea that non-statutory guidelines can be, in any general sense, uh, mandatory relevant considerations is a uh, difficult, uh, difficult proposition to uh, sustain. Probably difficult uh, even in terms of uh, statutory powers, but even more difficult in terms of non-statutory powers. Uh, in conclusion, then, uh, many of these propositions are, are tentative, must be tentative. In M61, the High Court in 2010 said that it was unnecessary to examine uh, the submissions about whether exercise of non-statutory executive power was limited by a requirement to afford procedural fairness. Um, but uh, what I want to uh, contend against is starting from the proposition that if grounds are available for statutory exercises of power, uh, then uh, that's a useful starting point. Uh, in Quinn, Justice Brennan said that in Australia the modern development and expansion of the law of judicial review had been achieved by an increasingly sophisticated exposition of implied limitations on the extent or the exercise of statutory power. And this, this approach is obviously not available uh, when considering uh, non-statutory powers. And nostalgic glances to Section 5 of the Judicial Review Act could well be the uh, wrong starting point. But what I want to uh, suggest uh, as a summary of what I've sought to develop and expose uh, with judicial review in prospect would be the following uh, 10 or 11 framework questions. First, what governmental power has been exercised? Is it non-statutory? Are individual rights or interests affected or is no more than an executive capacity involved? Uh, thirdly, is there a matter within Chapter 3? Fourthly, is a statute necessary to sustain the power's validity or is Section 61 of the Constitution sufficient? In other words, does the power exist as a non-statutory power? Fifthly, is the non-statutory executive power or the exercise of it consistent with the Constitution, including Chapter 3, Section 92, etc.? Uh, sixthly, are there any statutes that displace or qualify the non-statutory executive power or does the exercise of that power purport to qualify any statutory power or subvert a statutory scheme? Next, does the exercise of the power purport to alter or dispense with the law, including infringing certain fundamental common law rights? Uh, next, are the questions justiciable or do they concern high policy? That is to say, one or more questions which the court is not equipped to adjudicate upon or is the issue capable of practical determination by reference to legal principles, including remedies in a court of law. Uh, ninthly, has the person or entity exercising the non-statutory power misunderstood or misapplied the nature or scope of the power? Uh, here I would include the decision maker or actor uh, adopting a policy inconsistent with the power uh, or materially fettering the power so as not to consider individual cases on their uh, merits. Uh, next, penultimately, what is, what is the complaint? What are the so-called grounds in relation to the so-called manner of exercise? Has the manner of exercise materially miscarried so as to be procedurally unfair, including perhaps an unannounced departure from policy or guidelines, or seriously irrational or seriously illogical, including seriously illogical as self-contradictory, uh, including in relation to fact-finding, uh, or legally unreasonable, or exercised for an improper purpose. The proximity of the non-statutory power to a statute may show that the statute has expressly or impliedly excluded one or more of these bases uh, of complaint, for example, procedural fairness. And lastly, uh, uh, do any discretionary considerations come into play? Is it appropriate for the court to uh, grant a remedy? Thank you for attending and thank you for your attention.
the tradition of this of this series not to have questions. So I'm sorry for those who of you who are disappointed. I'm sure if you have questions, you can write to Alan. Um, if you don't know his email address, he probably doesn't want to answer you anyway. Um, for those people who are watching at home who cannot applaud, um, I, first of all, I thank the, the Supreme Court for making this facility available on the Supreme Court YouTube channel. Um, slam that subscribe button. It'll change your algorithm and bring you a cracker barrel full of fun, no doubt. Um, I, I thank uh, everybody who came. I thank Mr. Sherman for, for all of his assistance in bringing this together. Uh, normally, we have a dinner at the end of this event. Uh, because of the time of planning, we, we didn't arrange um, a, a, a public law section dinner uh, this evening. So I thank you all for coming. And um, one or more of you might be called by me soon about next year's event. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I, I should have said, and perhaps I could ask everybody who is here to give a, a round of applause for the really fantastic and really interesting speech, which I intend to ask questions about shortly. <laughs>